there's a very severe warning here given to us about this matter of men congratulating each other, speaking well of each other, uh, trading compliments with each other. Jesus said, I don't receive glory from men. Um, he said, I can tell that you don't have the love of God because you receive glory from one another. You enjoy being praised before men and being praised by men. Now, this is a very subtle thing because um, we ought to give honor where honor is due. We ought to recognize achievement. We ought to honor men who have succeeded in their fields. At the same time, there's a very real warning here which we ought to take. And that is that we do not seek glory from men, but rather we seek to have God give us approval. He goes on to say that when the time comes, it will not be Jesus that accuses them, but it will be the Old Testament, which he here calls Moses. It will be Moses that accuses you. He said, if you believe Moses, you would believe me because um, uh, Moses wrote about Jesus. Uh, read the account as they were then traveling through a grain field on a Sabbath day. I think we'll use uh, Mark's account. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck ears of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did? When he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered into the house of God when Abathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. Now it may be that some of our folks who are raised in the city will not understand this. Anybody who has spent time as I have in the wheat fields of Kansas or Missouri or North Dakota will have no trouble understanding this. There is a stage in the development of grain in which the gluten content is just right, the, the grain, the berries of the wheat are not yet hard. You can just take your finger and run it through a standing grain and strip off four or five heads of wheat. You just take it and rub in your hands like this and break the beards up and break the chaff off it blow it away a little bit and rub it some more and blow it away a little bit. When you look and find you've got 10, 12, 15 uh, grains of wheat all nice and clean with the last chaff gone, uh, you just pop them in your mouth and it gets to be like gum. It's quite, it's quite chewy. And what had happened was they're, on the, they're passing through the fields and the Jewish law permitted a person who was going through a, a vineyard to reach out and pick a bunch of grapes. He, was, he had to eat them on the spot. He was not allowed to take the grapes with him, but he could just reach out and take a, a bunch of grapes and eat them as he went through. Walking on a path, going through a grain field, he could take his fingers and strip off some heads and, as I said, rub them and blow the chaff away and eat it. He was allowed to do this. The trouble with the disciples was not they took the man's grain. This was permitted. But that they did this on the Sabbath day because it's obvious that that thrashing grain would be labor. And thrashing grain on the Sabbath day is simply not permitted. So when they had done this, they had worked. And it was the work on the Sabbath day that was wrong. And Jesus used this occasion to try to teach that the Sabbath is meant for our good. Uh, we're not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for us. Now, we as Christians do not keep the Sabbath. If someone asks you, uh, on what day do you keep the Sabbath? This is a trick question because uh, most evangelical question, Christians do not keep the Sabbath at all. They keep the Lord's Day, because we honor the day which the Lord is raised from the dead. But um, dealing here with the Sabbath, Jesus said it was made for your good, and this principle would hold over today. Even though we do not observe Sunday even as the Christian Sabbath, nevertheless the idea that one day in seven is good for your rest is something perhaps that some of our local industries ought to learn. Some of these men who are working seven days a week and 70 hour weeks uh, really are not at all being allowed to uh, do what the, um, what the scripture says here. It says the Sabbath is made 
for man, for, for man's good. And um, uh, the Jews persecuted him. But Jesus said, my father works. And he said, and I am working. Now, we want to understand this very clearly when we go back and interpret Genesis 1, when it says that the Lord entered into rest after he had had the six days of creation. But this does not mean a rest of inactivity. He rested from creation. But he did not rest from operating the world or keeping the world in, in motion. And Jesus said that my Father works hitherto, and I work. Another place we'll find he said, I do only those things which I see the Father doing. Now, friends, if you and I limited our activities to those things which we see God doing, we might find ourselves a lot less busy and with a lot more time for God. Most of our problems, when we say, I'm too busy, we've been doing things that we thought of, not things that God asked us to do. If God asks you to do something, he will give you all the time and all the money you need for it. If there's not time to do it, it's probably something you were not asked to do. If you don't have the money for it, it's probably something you weren't supposed to buy or own. God will provide time and money for every assignment that he gives. Even the army has that much sense in the quartermaster corps. We have a result here in verse 18 that might be of some interest. This was why the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also called God his father, making himself equal with God. Um, John brings this out more as he goes along than do the other writers, but he is, he is writing 30 years later than the other writers, and he is convinced, of course, of the deity of Christ, and he refers again and again to little hints that Jesus gave that God was his father. Um, we pick up the same idea now in uh, John uh, 5, 19, if you'll read that. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever he does, that the Father, that the Son also does. I think we have a warning here against doing too many things out of habit. Um, it's very easy for us to do something a second time, a third time, because it has worked once. A man who was in early in the Pentecostal movement by the name of Ole Severson, known in North Dakota mainly and California, gave the sharpest definition I've ever heard on the matter of fanaticism. It's this. He said fanaticism is doing yourself on Friday what the Holy Spirit led you to do on Monday. That is, God moves on. God does something once, and you enjoy it. You say, hey, that was great. Let's do it again. And then you of your own volition do it. It's not the will of God anymore. Uh, Jesus fed the 5,000 once. He fed the 4,000 once. He never fed them again. And there are many things that happen once. And our attempt to repeat our, our blessings or to say, uh, like the old, old story of the man who'd sought God for a long time and never found him in church meetings, and finally one day walked down the railroad track and in desperation got off the grade, went into a culvert, and knelt down in a six-foot culvert and found God. And after that he said to, my, to friends, he said, you don't have to go to church. He said, I'll tell you where to find God. Go down the railroad track and crawl in the culvert and pray. Now, this is trying to make, make everybody fit into our mold. It isn't that way. Fanaticism, said Ole Theverson, is doing on Friday what the Holy Spirit genuinely led you to do on Monday. Jesus said, I do only what I see the Father doing. And this modern day, we need to watch what God is doing and not be carried along entirely by tradition or the past or what's worked before. 